After a night of deliberation, Faulkner was led out of the house and hanged from the willow tree, his body later decapitated. Kiriopa, a follower of Pai Marere, re-entered the church and conducted a service with Faulkner's head in the pulpit beside him. Kiriopa gouged and swallowed the eyes of Faulkner, one eye allegedly representing Parliament and the other the Queen and British law. Faulkner was led out, and the last we have is this picture of him being led out he was hung in the willow tree and died in the willow tree. And then subsequently he was taken down from the tree. His body was thrown in a well. His head was chopped off. His blood was drained and put in the chalice. All who wished to associate themselves with the death drank the blood from the chalice in the Anglican Church, which would normally have the communion blood of Christ, remember, the communion wine. Now it had become literally blood. His eyes were plucked out and swallowed by Kiriopa. So in that way, Volkner was very deliberately killed, clearly as a sentence this was like an official killing. News of the killing of Volkner reached Crown officials at Makatu and Tauranga on the 6th of March, 1864. These reports came from coastal traders who were not present when Volkner was killed and from neighbouring iwi at pains to distance themselves from the act. Governor Gray heard of the killing on the 14th of March. In the months that followed, Whakatohia were a divided and disorganized iwi. They had recently lost a number of traditional leaders and were now split between followers of the new Paimarere faith and those who were refused to adopt it. Killing of a missionary is a big deal. To kill a missionary was to cross over a boundary that Europeans considered very dramatic. To kill a missionary was far more uh, horrifying than to kill women and children in this period. So something has to be done about it. Now what's interesting is, is how they get to identify Moko Moko as being one of those involved. There's a Portuguese trader who is hanging around the area. And in 1860, middle of 1865, in July, he writes a letter that gets to Governor Gray that fingers Moko Moko as one of those involved in the killing. So they already know kind of who they're looking for. There's been a huge degree of correspondence in this period between all sorts of people from Tiarawa and Natiawa in particular. It's all, um, second hand mainly, uh, it's not, you know, there's a few people who claim to be eyewitnesses. So by the time they're going into Whakatohi at the end of the year, they have a kind of hit list in their minds. The General Grey has allowed these court martials to take place on the general assumption that people will be tried, found guilty and executed very quickly. Uh, why does he do this? You know, why does he want this to happen in this way? I think he wants to send a message to the European world that he's getting on with the job <laughs> of, of, of finding the people who'd done this awful act. But he's also sending a message to his allies, to his Māori allies, that he is taking Paimereri seriously and he will deal to them because many of those allies see Paimereri as a real risk to their own communities. On the 11th of September, 1865, a crown force of 90 men landed among the sand dunes opposite Pa Kōwhai. They exchanged fire with a Whakatohia party, estimated at 90 to 100 strong. There is evidence that the crown force led with violence on their arrival in Oportiki, bombarding a village and shooting at local Māori. Ma 
Māori and Crown forces fought at Kohipawa Pa, but Māori outnumbered were forced to retreat into the bush. Rather than pursue them, the Crown troops at Kohipawa looted and burnt the pa to the ground. 58 casualties were reported for Whakatohia. After destroying Te Tarata pa, troops buried Māori dead in its trenches. In contrast, the Crown troops gave formal burials to their three fallen soldiers. So they then send troops in. And these are a very raggedy bunch of troops. They're um, colonial militia. They're not imperial troops. Um, they're supported by Whanganui. There is a proclamation made saying, hand over the murderers of the Reverend Volkner and all will be well. But there's no attempt, no attempt whatsoever to make those terms known to the whole area here. So a rather gung-ho military group with very poor discipline. The leader of the group gets um, sacked by his subordinate because he's drinking too much and that's affecting his leadership. When these European forces arrive, they do face resistance, but for the large part, those areas on the people on the coastal plains just shift inland. And in doing so, they abandon their crops and their animals. Uh, and the soldiers just, just loot and, and, and feed their way through. One soldier says, we had six meals a day. They ate beef and they ate mutton and they ate pig and they um, confiscated, stole all of the food that had been left. Nothing could prepare Mokomoko and his people for the tragedy that was to come. The chief, unaware he was a primary suspect for the killing of Karl Wagner, was thrown into an accusation that would be the start of a tragic and traumatizing downfall of his people. Mokomoko surrendered with at least 20 followers in October on the condition that his people would not suffer further punishment from the Crown. The difficulty for the Crown is identifying who in that group are the ringleaders. That's their real question. So when Mokomoko's name comes up, then that starts triggering that. I have to say, having read much of that correspondence um, uh, and even the evidence that's presented at the trial, uh, his name does not come up much <laughs> compared with the others who are, are tried with him. They're, they're much more central to what's going on. So Mokomoko is not, his status, and he's often given the status almost, you know, his name becomes, in a list of defendants, is often the first name. I think that reflects his status as a rangatira rather than the case that's made against him. Because he was accused of holding the rope, then that, of course, makes him an active participant in the actual event. If he provided the rope deliberately and that was handed over, so that, in a sense, I think was quite a, a, an important part of the evidence against him. And yet that evidence of the rope was contradicted by other witnesses uh, and certainly contradicted by Mokomoko himself. On the one hand, uh, he was described as having the rope, of, of putting it around his neck to demonstrate how uh, Volkner should be, should be hung, which doesn't make a lot of sense. In another case, um, He's holding a rope, but that's not the rope that's used. In another piece of the evidence, it's the rope off his horse that is taken to be used. So I think that that, that rope is the kind of problem for him, even though that evidence is very, very, very dodgy. This was a really difficult situation for anyone to make sense of. It was an event that occurred with uh, very few, if any, Māori witnesses, but it was also an event where most of those people who were really heavily behind it had disappeared. 
You know, they were in what the court would say, in the bush. So they weren't there to be either prosecuted or as witnesses. So just who you decided was sufficiently culpable to arrest and charge was a really open question because obviously someone who, um, you know, Kitty Opa was fine because he's he is definitely the leading actor and there's plenty on that. But someone who was less involved, someone who might have been an accessory, would have been, uh, you know, consent, but didn't actually take part, could still have been tried. The problem was working out just who you would charge. The strange thing is that how quickly it all takes place. It, it's over in pretty well a day. And they have the same defence lawyer, a guy by the name of James Carnell. But Carnell was not really up to it at all. He'd arrived in New Zealand only January 1864, so he had very little background in New Zealand law. And Arnie had only admitted him as a solicitor to the bar in New Zealand in uh, February. So, um, you know, just a month before the trial. Arnie is really not up to it. His cross-examination doesn't... just doesn't really exist at times. He doesn't question things. And he is defending over 30 people for their lives. Chief Muckle Muckle, court finds you guilty and sentences you to hang. But it is one of the real problems of the trial in that none of them, in my view, got a proper defence. The newspaper coverage of it is limited. It's not comprehensive. We don't know everything that took place in the trial. Most people watching that trial would not have realised the difficulties that took place in it. They would not have realised, for instance, that uh, one of the major witnesses to the trial was uh, a Ngāti Awa Rangatira, who had every reason to attack Moko Moko, just to keep Ngāti Awa out of responsibility for what had happened at Whakatohia. Even the examination of you know, Moko Moko really only gets to assert his evidence after the verdict and after the sentence has been passed. Moko Moko really makes it very clear that he is innocent of the charges, that the uh, arguments that have been presented against him have been fabricated. It's not a kangaroo court in a sense that it is not a court where the outcome is predetermined. Uh, the press treats it like a kangaroo court. The press treats all of the defendants as murderers from the very beginning and goes to great lengths to describe how devious and dark and dangerous these men look when they are engaged in the trial. Moko Moko himself did not give evidence. And whilst it's not a requirement that he does uh, uh, give evidence, and I understand at the time there was a common practice that lawyers didn't put the accused in the dock to give evidence. But of course, Moko Moko had no chance to respond to the allegations. And I believe none of the other defendants gave evidence as well. The Crown, as I understand it, produced six witnesses. A number of them did not reference Moko Moko being anywhere near Volgner at the time. And one of the missionary witnesses, after the fact, did raise a concern with the Chief Justice about the contradictory evidence uh, that had been put before the court, which led to Moko Moko's conviction, and no doubt others. So it's one of those problematic events, that trial, where those people attending it would not necessarily have seen any miscarriage of justice necessarily. But its brevity, 
its lack of an effective defence, the fact that so many individuals were on uh, trial for their lives, uh, makes it you know, an outstandingly um, difficult trial to actually get to the bottom of. Usually the more, the longer things go, the more you can see the evidence, the more that things can unravel. Um, certainly the defence lawyer had no understanding of the Māori world um, and that was taking place. The execution of a rangatira, loss of whānau and whenua was too much for the people of Whakatohia. Chief Mokomoko had requested that his body be brought back to his sacred land, not realising at the time of his death that his family had been brutally murdered by British militia. The impact of Volkner's murder and the execution of Chief Mokomoko was enormous. The aftermath sent colossal waves of despair, crushing the spirits and lives of the chief's descendants for many years. Generation after generation would fight for their tipuna, for his innocence, for mana, and for their chief who sacrificed himself so his people could live. He was told at the time, if you surrender your rebels, then we will stop the fighting against the people of Te Whakatohia. All war would stop. That was the primary reason for his surrender, because he could see what was happening to his people. He could see what was happening to their crops. He could see what had happened to their boats. Te Whakatohia was quite a wealthy, wealthy tribe, or a wealthy series of hapu. That whakaro of protecting the boundary, ultimately protecting a kai resource, but also protecting the people, can be feathered into perhaps one of the reasons why he surrendered when the colonial soldiers invaded the Opotiki Rohe. He surrendered to stop the fighting, stop the warring upon his people. Many of the rangatira had fallen in various battles prior to the invasion, and he was seen as one of the few rangatira left that I think um, the Crown saw that would be a barrier to their gaining further land in the Eastern Bay of Plenty. Firstly, and naturally, if you grow up knowing that your tūpuna was allegedly uh, hung someone and was subsequently hung himself, that must have an impact, regardless of guilt or otherwise, particularly in, in the Māori world. Secondly, and as we now know, the whānau have always pronounced his innocence, and so did Mukumuku. And so there's that element there that they cannot revisit the past to have a fair trial, to revisit all of the evidence that was filed, because he's gone. And the third element, I guess, is that the whānau have had to live with the allegation that the alleged actions of their tūpuna brought the Crown troops to town and killed, pillaged and raped a number of people and confiscated their lands. And carrying all of those things, particularly those that carried the Mokomoko name. Mokomoko was determined that his body be returned home. However, that request was uh, not acceptable and he was buried in the Mount Eden uh, New Prison yard, as were all other convicted, executed prisoners of the time. And they were buried in unmarked graves.
You've got to, I, I think, acknowledge that this was 19th century uh, New Zealand. We cannot look back through present eyes and judge the standards of the day. But the treaty, Article 3, gave Māori the same rights as British subjects, which must include the right to a fair trial. I understand he spoke at his, at his sentencing, again pleaded his innocence, and obviously uttered the words that are now part and parcel of the whanau's ahua um, before he was hung. Testimony that Mokomoko had carried the rope with which Volkner was hanged was to be crucial in his conviction. No witness, however, claimed that Mokomoko was directly involved in the killing itself. According to Te Whakatohia, the rope had been taken from Mokomoko's possession. In the end, the evidence was deemed sufficient to make him an accessory to Volkner's murder. Mokomoko denied responsibility for the killing. He claimed that he went away after the decision was made to kill Volkner and was not present at the death. Mokomoko. Heremite Kahupaya. Hakaraya Terahui. Horomona Poropiti. Mikaire Kirimangu were all sentenced to be executed on the 17th of May, 1866. The remaining defendants on trial were sentenced to life in prison. Tango hia te taura i taku kaki, kia waiata au, i taku waiata. Kaone te takiri e tute nei, ki te mo e ngā kai te hori, te Te harakore anahau, te nakoto pakehama, hayaha. <laughs>